All right, well, good morning and welcome back. Uh, we took a little time off um, just to kind of get some rest, try to catch up, try to get some things done. So we are back with the last psalm of the first one-third of our journey. So psalms is 150 of them, and we are at 50, and then then we'll move on to our the, the second third, verse uh, Psalm 51 to... I can't do the math at the moment, but so one third through Psalms, it's been a long journey, but it's been a prosperous journey, a profitable journey. Um, I've learned a lot and I hope that you have as well. So Psalm 50 is actually a Psalm of Asaph. It's the first one that we have of, of his Psalms. So I will read the entire thing, and I, I'm not sure if we're going to go through the whole thing today or not, but uh, I'll let you know. We'll just keep going until we run out of time. The mighty God, even the Lord, hath spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous around about him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself. Selah. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, and I will testify against thee. I am God, even thy God. I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices or burnt offerings to have, to have been continually before me. I will take no bullock out of thy house, nor he goats out of thy folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine, and the fullness thereof. Will I eat of the flesh of bulls, or drink of the blood of goats? Offer unto God thanksgiving, and pay thy vows unto the Most High, and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. But unto the wicked say, God saith, What hast thou to do to declare my statutes, or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth? Seeing that thou hatest instruction, and castest my words behind thee, when thou sawest a thief, then thou consentedest with him, and hast been partaker with adulterers. Thou givest thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue frameth deceit. Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother, thou slanderest thine own mother's son. These things hast thou done, and I kept silence, though thoughtest that I was altogether such as one of one as thyself, but I will reprove thee, and set them in order before thine eyes. Now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me, and to him that ordereth his conversation or conduct aright will I show the salvation of God. So this is considered, um, my, my, the imagery I have is the courtroom of God. This is the first psalm, like I mentioned, that we have from Asaph. And Asaph was a chief singer and a musician of David in Solomon's uh, era. He was also noted as a prophet in musical compositions. Asaph begins this psalm declaring God has spoken. The mighty God, even the Lord, hath spoken. In this declaration, the psalmist refers to God in terms of utmost majesty, using El, God, Almighty, Elohim, the object of religious fear, and Yahweh, or Jehovah, the self-existent and covenant God. The mighty God, El, even the Lord, Elohim, even has, has spoken, so the mighty, excuse me, El, God, Elohim, even the Lord, Jehovah, hath spoken. So there's an emphasis on God in his completeness. So God, everything about God, everything we know about God, everything about God's character has spoken. This is, this is a, hey, pay attention. This God has spoken to the earth. And the second part of this verse, from the rising of the sun to the going down thereof, expresses that God has spoken to the entire earth. Everywhere 
the sun touches. From the rising of the sun to the going down thereof, from, every, from beginning to end, from the first part of the day to the last part of the day and so on, God has spoken. This message covers everywhere. If we're looking at verse 2, out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. This is recalling Exodus 19. Asaph builds this idea of the anticipation for the coming judgment of the Lord, similar to what was uh, on Mount Sinai. But this time God comes to Zion. This is verse 2 and 3. Well, Spurgeon wrote about this, fire is the emblem of justice in action. And the tempest is a token of his overwhelming power. So out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. Verse 4, he shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. This verse expresses the truth of 1 Peter 4, 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. So the first, the first group of people he's addressing is his own people, his chosen people. Judgment starts at the house of God. Judgment starts at God's people. Why? Because we've been called to a higher standard. We've been called to a higher purpose. If you, if you claim to be a follower of Christ, then you've just established the fact that you, you anticipate a higher standard, a stricter judgment, a, a tighter walk, if you will. And so... We must be judged first because God expects more out of us. If, you, if you've never given your life to Christ, if you've never trusted in Jesus, if you've never uh, committed to walking in his way, then God isn't surprised by your lack of commitment or your lack of, um, oh, what's the word? kind of walking in his way, if you will. So the judgment of, of that person will be, and this isn't this is an eternal judgment we're talking about. This is uh, evaluation judgment. So the, the evaluation of those who never put their trust in Christ is going to be a little bit different than those who have. Those who have have now admitted that they understand, that they that they have a relationship with Christ. So then God now expects a certain behavior, a certain obedience, a certain commitment, a certain kind of way about them. So when we don't live that way, we don't live according to what we say we believe, then there's a greater, there's a, gr a greater judgment, a greater uh, consequence. So, to turn the tables, the psalmist is announcing that this judgment is for Israel. She is the one on trial here. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me. Gather my people unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. God is calling his people to the courtroom. Now, in context... God is calling specifically Israel, those um, who have, you know, the covenant nation. However, by principle and extension, we are also included in this trial. Think of, of when Paul talks about the Gentiles being grafted in. So when you, when you put your faith in Christ, you have now become part of the covenant people, part of the chosen ones, part of God's saints, as, as we're seeing here. Gather my saints together. Again, context is referring to Israel because the New Testament hasn't happened yet. So the, the covenant that these people are, are responding to is the covenant by sacrifice. The covenant we respond to is also a covenant by sacrifice, but it was the sacrifice of Christ that gave us this new covenant. So in whole, we are in this group of, of people that are called to gather into the courtroom so, so God can 
make his uh, evaluation of us. And the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself. This judgment, however, again, is not referring to eternal judgment because we're not appointed to wrath. And we understand that. This is, this is, again, this is the evaluation of his people. So verses 1 through 7 are really the opening warning and invitation. So everybody, gather my saints into my courtroom so I may judge them according to the way they've been behaving. I can, so I can evaluate their, their living at this point. So it's preparation for what is about to take place. God says, get all my people together. We've got some work to do. It's, it's got the idea as the statement, all rise, the honorable judge, Lord God Almighty presides in the case of God versus his people. Okay, think of it that way. Think of God is sitting up there, not waiting to determine your, your sentence, but to judge your works, to judge your your commitment, to judge your actions. Okay, Verse 8, I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices or thy burnt offerings that have been continually before me. So, okay, so right there, God is saying, I'm not, I'm not here to judge you on your sacrifices or your burnt offerings. I'm not going to punish you. I'm not going to correct you on this, the fact that you are making those sacrifices because Old Testament law, you were required to do that. He's not saying don't do that. But what he is talking about, and we'll get to that in a moment, is how they were doing it. I will not take no bullock out of thy house, nor he goats out of thy folds, for every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. God's not saying, I don't need you to sacrifice to me because everything is mine. Everything belongs to me. You can't give me something that isn't yours to give. You can't give me something that is already mine. God doesn't need our sacrifices. But before you think that I am telling you that sacrifice isn't important, listen to what the psalmist says. Sacrifice is more about the cost than the action. The action is important. The action is required. But it's the, the heart behind the action that God is referring to. In verse 8, again, God speaks through the psalmist and says that he is going, he's not going to rebuke his people for sacrifices, which supports the importance of the concept. However, 9 to 13 explained to us that it may, it may be true that God desires a heart that is willing to sacrifice, Old Testament and New Testament. So, I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifice or thy burnt offerings because I've asked you to do that, because I told you that's what you're supposed to do. But, don't come to me with your sacrifices thinking you're giving me something that I don't already own, thinking that you're doing me a favor. Come to me with your sacrifices with a heart of repentance, a heart of, of you know, humility and, and you know, this, this, it's, it's not about what you're bringing, it's about how you're bringing it. Um, Consider the, the, the widow's mite in the Gospels. Remember that. Okay, this woman had two little coins, maybe even one. It, it, I think it varies in description. And she gave it. And it's all she had. And then the, the rich guy over here gave all kinds of stuff and said, look at how much I've given. And Christ said, she has given more because she's been given, she's given out of her all she had. This is everything she owned, essentially. And she gave it. The cost for her was greater. But it shows her commitment. It shows her, her desire to give out of her, her heart. This other guy who was given, every, given all this money, who basically isn't really affecting him one way or another, thinks that by giving this amount, he's doing somebody else a favor. That's not the way God desires it. That's not the way he wants us to give. That's why it says, decide in your own hearts what you're going to give. If you give 10% as a tithe, and again, we're not going to talk 
about that much. Just because you think you're supposed to, well, then it's kind of defeated the purpose. The point is to give out of your heart, to give out of what you feel that God has called you to give. And it should cost you something. It shouldn't be. If 10%, here, here's an example. If 10% of what you earn giving to God doesn't, doesn't hurt you in any way, isn't a risk, then my recommendation would be don't go by the 10%. Give in a way that could potentially cause you concern to where you need to rely on God to work with it. Okay, that, in my opinion, giving up to and beyond the point of uncomfortability is, is an example of our commitment. It's an example of our trust in God and his ability to bless us and work with what we do. Again, that's my opinion. You can take it how you, how you please, but don't give 10% just because you read that the Bible says give 10%. That's, that defeats the purpose of the sacrifice of the generosity. The, the quantity isn't the issue. It's the, it's the heart behind the action. It's, it's about the cost to yourself, not the material value overall, but, but what it is costing you as, you know, it's this, this widow who gave very little, but it was everything she had. The cost was greater because again, it's everything she had. So these verses explain God owns everything. We can never give him anything that he doesn't already own. But when we come to God with an offering of sacrifice, thinking we're doing God a favor, God declares, I do not need anything from you. You see, we can add nothing to God. He is self-sufficient, self-sustained. And while this is true, he does desire our heartfelt willingness to remember it. And it's all his and, and be willing to give accordingly. So we should never restrain from giving to God because we don't own anything anyway. If you're holding back thinking it's yours, then you're actually robbing God, in a sense, even though it's still his. The attitude should be, God, this is yours anyway. I should have no issues giving it to you or pretending to give it to you because, again, you own it. Releasing my grip on it. And again, it's not only financial issues. It's not only material things. It's everything. It's your family. It's your marriage, it's your children, it's your job, it's your whatever. God, these things are yours. Do with them what you please. I trust you with them and I will accept whatever you make happen in that stuff. This is, this is the, the ultimate trust in God. These things are yours. I'm, I'm, I'm committing them to you that you may do your will and not mine. In verse 14, so we've, we've covered that. Offer unto God thanksgiving and pay thy vows unto the Most High. Verse 14 tells us the kind of sacrifice God desires of us. But how could thanksgiving be a sacrifice? Now, that was the question when I got to this verse. So offer unto God thanksgiving. And we've, uh, it's other, spoken otherwhere in Scripture where it says a sacrifice of thanksgiving. So I asked myself, how could thanksgiving be a sacrifice? Well, consider a situation where anger or bitterness or fear or anxiety or, or something along those lines would be the natural human response. Now, instead of acting on those emotions, which seem like they fit the scenario, it would be a sacrifice in a sense, sacrificing your desires to respond in those ways and instead give thanks. I think that, that to sacrifice our desire to respond incorrectly is, 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 is and, and replacing it with thanksgiving is exactly what this means. A sacrifice of thanksgiving means it's something that I have a hard time letting go of it's hard time actually giving how can i give thanks in this scenario 
Well, by rearranging my emotions or understanding what I know to be true, regardless of my emotions, then I can give thanks. And it would be a sacrifice for me because I'm sacrificing the desire of the flesh to respond incorrectly. And this pay vows is, is really expressing the, our urge to commit yourself to the most high. Pay thy vows unto the most high. Commit. When you, you get married, you talk about your vows. These are commitments. These are promises you make. These are things that you say that you determine in your heart to accomplish throughout your marriage. Now, many fail. We all mess up. But the point is, is to lay out this idea and pay your vows, pay your commitments, put forth what you've promised God in that. And call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. So by committing yourself to God, you can be sure that he will be there when you call on him, and you will glorify him. When he answers your prayer, and take note, because he does, you should appropriately glorify him for saying, this is an answered prayer. Now, we had uh, a recent answered prayer in our family. Um, we prayed for quite some time for a relative to come to faith. And we prayed all the time. And God showed up and made it work and made it happen. And we praise God for it. God gets all the glory for this. Praise God. Angels were celebrating that day. And, and we, we shouted. We jumped as well. Praise God for those kinds of things. But it's important to take note when God does answer prayer because we need to make sure that we give him the credit for it. And, and we need to share it with others saying this, this is an answered prayer. We prayed for this and God showed up and did exactly what we asked him to do. Now, 16, but unto the wicked, so he's, he's changing his, his approach here for a moment. And he's talking about those among God's people who, who are giving sacrifices with, a, with an empty heart, with, a, you know, with the wrong motive. God, through the psalmist, is speaking to the wicked among God's people. God is addressing the problem, problem excuse me, of ritualism. This idea that, that the system or the formula is what's important. Now, the voice wrote, the real problem with ritual is that if forms are all there is to our religion, they give us feelings of being right with God when actually we may be guilty of the most terrible sins. We've ritualized a lot of religion, if you will, to think that, well, I've, I've checked my boxes. I've genuflect and, you know, those kinds of things. And now I'm, I'm good. I've, I've done the work. I've, I've, I've showed my work, you know, and, and, and now God is happy with me. All is well. This is, this is a lie from the enemy, thinking that we could, we could do enough. It's, it, God doesn't require us to make formulaic, systematic kind of things to, to line his will up with ours. To make him happy with us. Oh, thank you for doing this and and making this and, and you know all these different ritualistic kind of moves. God is essentially asking them what right do they think they have, declaring God's statutes but living in contradiction. He is calling out their hypocrisy. You're you're going to the temple. You're giving your sacrifices and you go out and you live as anybody else does. You're, what right do you have to point out the statutes that I have made when you have no desire to live by them? Okay, that, is a, that is a hypocrite if we've ever seen one. Verse 18, when thou sawest a thief, then thou consented with him and hast been partaker with adulterers Thou givest thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue frameth deceit. Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother 
thou slanderest thine own mother's son. Verse 18, thou consented. Just because you may not be thieving with the thief, your silence against those kinds of things is your, is your consent, is your approval. God desires us to live differently. God desires us to stand out. God desires us to point out sin. Now, primarily, this is speaking of God's people. We are to, to reprove, we are to rebuke, we are to, to address the issues of sin amongst God's people. Now, when you say nothing, you are, you are approving it, you are consenting to it because you decide it's not important enough to address it's, it is, uh, let's see, Van uh, Gemmerin, it is, he said, it is true that the people who have broken the seventh, eighth, and ninth commandments have broken the whole commandment. But it is also true that those who associate with covenant breakers fall under the same condemnation. Sin lies both in the act and the consent. Keep that in mind. Just because you don't do the action the fact that you say nothing or stand by makes you an accomplice, if you will. They have lost sight of the holiness of God. God's holiness sets him apart from all things. They become relaxed in their obedience and relationship to God. Verse 21, these things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such as one as thyself, but I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. I kept silent. Okay? We tend to misunderstand God's silence as quiet approval. Or if God isn't saying anything, if God isn't doing anything, then he's okay with this. Let me be clear. When a person is quiet about a sin, he is approving it. When God is quiet about a sin, he is long-suffering. He is patient. He's waiting for you to figure it out before he steps in and does something you aren't going to enjoy. This is not God's quiet approval, but an example of his patience. But God eventually makes a move, and while his patience waits, his love also requires him to seek justice and set things in order. So it may be for some time you're thinking God is okay with this because God isn't doing anything. Wait long enough and God will make it known his opinion. Verse 22, now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. Consider this, think about it. Instead of ritualism, Verse 23, whoso offereth praise glorifies me, and to him that orders his conduct aright will I show salvation of God. Instead of ritualism with an empty heart, turn to God in humility, offer up praise, forsake your hypocrisy and your wickedness, and repent. This is God's invitation to all mankind. Turn from your empty ways and your wickedness and offer praise to God. Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving, regardless of your circumstance. That is God's will. It is God's will that you find a way to be thankful for everything in everything. Rejoice in the Lord always. So we made it through Psalm 50. The first one-third of Psalms, our journey is just beginning. So stay tuned. Uh, we, will, we will tackle Psalm 51 in the near future, if not tomorrow. I'm still working on that one. So as always, thank you for watching. Like, subscribe, do the Twitter thing, you know, and, and whatever you find, you know, um, fitting. And uh, we will see you next time. Thank you and God bless.